to be 80th anniversary of the exhibition of Eastern New Acquisition. So on the occasion of our, our 80th anniversary, we planned this show and to highlight works that have, are, are new to our collection. And we're really pleased to be collaborating with Poetry Ireland on this um, event, uh, this series of Poetry Encounters, um, which have featured altogether four artists uh, uh, are linked up with poets um, who will read from their work and together they'll share and exchange insights into their own work. And I know that um, Tara and Tanina spent a bit of time to be able to we're I think we're in for a treat today. Um, I'm delighted also to welcome uh, Elizabeth Mowen of Poetry Ireland, who will introduce Tara Bergen in a moment. Um, and we're really pleased to have you today. I'm Anna O'Sullivan, the director of the gallery, in case any of you don't know me. Um, I'll, I'll start by introducing Helena, and Helena Gorey is, uh, grew up in rural Kilkenny, where her ancestral roots are hundreds of years old. We are gathered around her painting here, um, uh, Chickweed, this one here, um, from her 2013 exhibition at the Butler Gallery, um, which was entitled The Orchard, and which continued her ongoing concern with place and looked at the restoration of an orchard planted in Kilkenny by her grandfather in the 1930s. Helena's reclamation and investigation of the family's orchard focused more on the smallness of the orchard's plants and blossoms rather than the magnitude of the apple tree. Her most recent solo exhibition was Understory at Highlands Gallery, the Custom House Gallery. Concentrating on richness of colour and texture, the Understory paintings attempt to give some sense of the beauty that can be seen in jewel-like plants if you look closely into an uncut uh, hedgerow at the height of summer. Continues her engagement with the natural world, which is also going to affect in exhibitions such as Prosenium and the Ashford Gallery in 2018, the Orchard at the Public Gallery in 2013, Two Trees at the Dock in 2006, the Blackheart Guild in 2001, and Landscape of Memory in 1999 at the Cabinet Gallery. Her work was recently selected for group exhibitions at the Mark Borgian Gallery in New York and Contemporary Irish Art Centre uh, in Los Angeles and exhibitions at Ralph Barnum Castle and Farnley Gallery. She won the Artworks Award at Visual Carnival in 2020 and received the highly commended award for Highlands Gallery's open submission in the same year. She curated the Overhanging Garden for AKA Kilkenny Arts Festival in 2021 and her work is installed at the Grange Gorman Primary Care Centre as part of the GDA Public Art Program. Public collections include the OPW, the Irish Museum of Modern Art, Limerick City Gallery of Art, the Arts Council, Highlands Gallery, ourselves, Public Gallery, the Glebe Gallery, and uh, apart from studying at the Limerick School of Art and Design, she was represented by Niagara Gallery. Uh, before I pass it on to Tara, I just, while I have your attention, just want to read your, um, uh, to remind you that next Thursday, March 23rd, uh, performance artist Suzanne Walsh will present a commissioned response to the, uh, the, the, the 80th anniversary exhibition on the concept of collection, which proved really interesting. It's on for six to seven ish next Thursday, and it's on, um, uh, you can book a place on our, our website. Uh, so I'll pass you on to Elizabeth, who will introduce Tara. Thanks for your time. Thank you so much for that, Anna. Um, so, as Anna said, I'm Elizabeth Moen. Uh, I'm program manager for Poetry Ireland, and I'm going to welcome you on the poetry side of things. Um, so, we're so delighted to be here, partnering with uh, and hosted by the phenomenal Butler Gallery, um, and joined by two top tier, thought provoking artists. Um, so, Tara Bergen has published three collections of poetry with Carcanet Press. This is Yero, winner of the Seamus Heaney Prize for Poetry and the Tragic Death of Eleanor Marx, shortlist T.S. Eliot and Forward Prizes. Her most recent book, Savage Tales, continues to explore original territory, bringing the riddle, song, and dialogue into a series of formally inventive and floppy comic sequences. This collection asks us to steer our way through chorus exchanges and situations as she charts the fraught course between the making of individual poems and uneasy bedfellow of the sustained activity and authority which is always here called into question. Dramatizing the contemporary, the classic with great wit, ingenuity, and panache, Savage Tales affirms Bergen as one of the outstanding poets of her time. I don't want to steal a minute more away from the event that lies ahead of us, so I'm excited now to sit down with the rest of you and hear this conversation unfold. Thank you so much. Thanks very much. Um, that was wonderful, two wonderful introductions. I'm just, I'm just 
sort of wading in. I think uh, Helena and I met for the first time yesterday, but um, I've been a fan now of her work since being introduced to this piece by the Butler Gallery. So thank you very much for bringing this to my attention, bringing Helena's work to me. Uh, it's been fascinating, kind of delving into it. And yeah, I'm, I'm pushing forward myself to start the conversation just because I think um, I'm a wordy person, being a poet, I suppose. So I'm very happy to, to go with words. So I'm going to start by reading out some of the notes that I made when I first started to look at this work. And uh, from seeing it online first, actually, and then coming to see it in the room was a really interesting experience. And of course, the thing that caught my attention first was the title. So being a poet, I'm, I'm drawn to the words almost first. Um, chickweed, uh, a small flower, uh, often despised by gardeners. They think it's a weed, and so they, they take it, try to get rid of it. Um, so small, and of course, this is a small square as well. And I noticed that the measurements, you know, underneath the painting, it says how, how the size of it, and it's 30 centimeters by 30 centimeters. And it's almost entirely white, as you can see, except for this green frame. And what I wasn't sure about when I saw it online, but was confirmed when I came in and, and could see it in the flesh, was that the frame is not really a frame, it's painted on. So it's, it, it has no frame, and yet the artist has, has framed the white with green, which I think is we might come back to as to why and what's that all about. And, and also, as you can see, the white um, sort of drips down, so it's a square, but, but uh, the white is, is trying to get out of that square shape maybe a little bit and covering some of that green. And there's a tiny bit of black at the top, which is also very appealing to me as a poet. Tiny bit of darkness within the, the beauty of the white. And the other thing that I noticed about the size of it was that the measurement is uh, 30 centimetres, it's about uh, a foot. And in um, Ancient times, this uh, measurement is called a cubit. And a cubit, um, the word apparently comes from the Latin meaning elbow. And it's, it's the size of your forearm. And this in itself um, sort of seemed to symbolize to me the smallness and intimacy of this painting, that it was actually the length of a part of our body, and especially the arm, which is associated with you know, making and drawing and writing. And, and the only reason I know the word cubit <laughs> is that it's in an Emily Dickinson poem that I've read many times. And I didn't know what that word meant when I read the Emily Dickinson poem. She's measuring her bedroom in cubits in this poem. So I looked up the word cubit then when I was studying this poem. And so I thought of it when I thought of Emily Dickinson then when I saw this painting as well. This small space, very intimate, almost part of of our, our body, you know, measurable on a part of our body. And um, this intimacy really came alive for me when I walked in those doors for the first time yesterday and saw it in, in this space with this massive drawing beside it. And then these, these other you know, massive square opposite, black square. And then this like a little tiny window you know, into, into the soul or into nature and, and, and so, delicate and small, like the flower, chickweed. So all these things came to mind when I saw it. And um, personal, personal was a word that came to me. So I'm getting to a question. I am, uh, and I will stop talking in a second. What, what I've jotted down here, like really in note form, was very abstract, very modern, yet also very formal, like a very formal poem. And I've written here, a monochromed lyric poem, limited imagery, restricted vocabulary, principal subject is earthly love. So my question to you, Helena, uh, Helena, sorry, is um, when, when I say it's like a poem or it's, it's this small square that's very intimate, like measured on parts of the body, and I'm comparing it to, to a poem on the page, do you, how do you feel about that? Like, do you think it's do you think it's right to compare um, a painting to a poem? Yeah, I think very much so, I, and particularly since we started to talk about it, yeah. and, you know, email and things like that. And and I wouldn't have thought about poetry and painting 
in that way before. I, I suppose I would have thought, you know, m music, you know, in relation mm. to to um, to painting. But um, but why? I could, because I, it's ab because music is abstract and has no words. Um, or? May, well, maybe in terms of if there's no lyrics, yeah, yeah, maybe. Yeah. Um, whereas, whereas now I can I can kind of see see poetry not just you know with other thing rhythms and uh, you know other things in poetry mm. rather than just kind of intent and and meaning and and right. um, you know and and like you, you described it in some of the emails like you know a little glimpse of something mm. and. Uh, so I can totally see the, the comparisons and how, how they would be. And I mean, that's how I feel about painting as well. You know, it doesn't have to be a literal kind of, yeah. uh, you know, explanation. Yeah. And in a way, you know, maybe because I was a latecomer to poetry, maybe I thought it had to be, you had to understand it in a very literal way. Um, I don't know, of course, you, you, there, there are, you can come back and back to it and there are different meanings you'll get all the time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it doesn't have to be instantaneous, I think. And, you know, paintings in the same way you can, you know, you, you can keep looking and looking and every time you look, you, you may see something, something different, you know, and, and I suppose I really like that, you know, comparison now with, with poetry. I think it makes sense to me. I think that idea of the glimpse uh, is so, it's so relevant like, to, to working as a poet because for me, certainly, um, and I don't know whether this, like your journey to being a painter is the same, but m to become a poet was never like my intention. It might, it might have been there since I was young, like I was writing poems, but I always thought to be a writer was to be the, a writer of short stories, you know, obviously eventually novels, maybe um, plays and things like that. And um, I wasn't like practicing my, my poetry that much, um, but, but I struggled with writing short stories. I couldn't write short stories at all, even though that was the one thing I thought I would do first. And I realized that um, what was bothering me was this whole idea of having the, the beginning and then the middle bit and then the end. And I was like, I can't, I can't do all that. You know, that whole development of, of narrative was just not, not working for me. And I realized that what I really wanted was that middle bit. That's what I, I like to get in, glimpse, get out again and no explanation you know I'm not going to answer any questions I just want the kind of the moment the seized moment in fact we were talking about we both share a love of photography as well which you could say is sort of surprising on the one hand with a painting like this which has no people in it you know it has um you could say no narrative but actually it's I think similar in that idea somebody looks through a lens thinks that's it gets it and what you see um, it is this moment, almost like the middle without the beginning or the end. And so certainly poetry for me, I suddenly realized a poem can do that. A poem can do something that a, a short story or a novel can't do. It can just go, there you go, you know, take it or leave it. And I really enjoyed that. It, it, seemed, it seemed a daring sort of approach, but also that idea of, and this is something I got from looking at your painting, not wanting to meddle too much you know, as well, not wanting to interfere too much. I'll take what I can. It's like the essence of the thing that it gave to me and, and um, not try and reproduce it fully. Like, I'm not going to give the whole story. I'll, I'll read you, um, we've talked about sort of poems. Like, I'm going to read you this really short poem because I've mentioned Emily Dickinson. And there's um, this really short poem in, in my book, which I'll read. And I don't know if you can see, but in the book itself, the poem is only eight lines long, but it makes this little square on the page. And again, it's just like a way of thinking about poetry. Like even before you know what it's about or you've read it, there it is, this small square, you know, like here. So if my poem was on the wall, it would, it would be that shape probably, you know. And it kind of, like you said about meaning, it, it um, what does it mean? I don't know, it's like so short, it almost doesn't mean anything. And yet hopefully it, it, it's like dropping a pebble in a well, something starts to happen after you've read it maybe, and you can, you can think, okay. So this one anyway, this I won't, usually I give a really long introduction, like the introduction's about a billion times longer than the poem itself. It's, a, it's about when I, I discovered you could rent Emily Dickinson's bedroom. Right. <laughs> in, in the Emily Dickinson Museum, apparently you can go and you can pay money, you can, you can spend an hour there. And so I started to think, what an odd thing for someone to do. But then, of course, I, 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 I fantasized about the uh, kind of application letter I would write. 
And I, I made it smaller. It started out quite a long poem, but I made it smaller and smaller and smaller, kind of so it got that really suggestive, unsaid stuff happening underneath it. So I'll read it. And it is just called Renting Emily Dickinson's Bedroom by the Hour. I don't want to do anything. I just want to watch. I want to see what she saw. I don't want to touch or be touched. I want a different kind of pain. If I can get it once, I won't come back again. So see what they make of that. <laughs> I don't know if they'll let me in. So, but, but the point is very short. Um, and where is the meaning in that? What was I getting at? And I think it was the fun I had in writing that poem was in the drafts, I, you know, I kept all the drafts. And when I read back over the drafts, the, the, you know, the early drafts, I'm saying it all. I'm all, all my thoughts are displayed in the poem. And then I wanted, obviously, to, to get it into this small shape that was really tight and kind of its own thing. So cutting away a lot of the, the words, you know, and a lot of the meaning, I suppose, a lot of the explanation, the literalness. Mm, mm. Is there an equivalent in what you do in the process of making a painting? Do you, do you draw the chickweed fully and color it all in and then think, no, I, I don't want all that messing, I just want I just want something purer. Hmm. Yeah, it's. Um, I suppose it's 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 kind of it, it's very process. I suppose you know in in this particular one, I think it started as a black painting. You know, I suspect um, it was. I was trying. We were talking about. I was trying to kind of remember. You know. That's so. Um, interesting. so um, and you know, the, the, which a lot of them do. They they can go from light to dark and dark to light, and um, so. And, uh, you know, with, with the, f the framing of it, we were talking about this mm. yesterday and I was trying to kind of remember, you know, um, and I looked at the photograph again and, and um, you know, because it it's over 10 years old. So it's, um, you know, the process is always quite similar. And um, so I, sus I suspect because of that gr green, well, it, it ended up, you know, going from black to, to white, I would imagine, or just off white. And it, I wasn't happy with that either. And, mm -hmm. I, and I suspect that was because of the edges. And we talked about drawing a lot kind of mm -hmm. yesterday. And um, I, I think uh, there's something about um, just a quality of a, of a mark, mm -hmm. you know, that, um, you know, I, I was saying that I can be very self-conscious drawing, you know, that it's not, I don't have a natural facility for, for drawing. Um, now I, I can draw but yeah. it doesn't come easy to me, you know, and, um, and sometimes I will draw with, with paint. And um, so I was thinking then afterwards, you, after we spoke, I was thinking, well, you know, with a drawing, you have to get it straight away. You can't overwork it, you can't, you know, redo yeah. it. But yeah. whereas with a painting, particularly with oil paint, you, you have that kind of license to, to oh, you know, I have to go out of that, keep at it, you know? Yeah. Um, so I suspect th there were edges that I wasn't happy with, that I didn't like the quality of the line, and um, and probably because the, of the, the white that was there initially. Um, you know, I was looking at, at plants and think, oh, it's it's that that green is just you know chickweed comes out at this time mm. of year. It's one of the early kind of greens, and yeah, that that might work with that, and kind of you know had to introduce it into the painting in some way and then I thought well I can also I can also cover these marks at the edge that I don't I'm not very happy with mm. you know and um and 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 from there so I suspect then it was a square within a square at that stage yeah. um but there wasn't enough kind of depth <laughs> kind of maybe within the 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 whites and um and I think this was probably the, the, the first one in that series of, of, of paintings, which were kind of plants, you know, based on, on, on plants that I found in the orchard or we found in the orchard, um, wild, all wild native plants. Um, uh, so so this, this, this time I decided to, to try and let it flow off the, you know, off the painting. So that's, that's what that happened. So it came through the edge mm. and... Um, you know, left little little hints of, of what was underneath. Um, so in terms of, um, of like intellectualizing it all, because mm -hmm. I was re so I read loads of stuff into this and I was telling you all the things that I've decided about this painting. And then I was reading one of your um, lovely kind of review that was written about your work and it was saying, don't try and intellectualize this, just, 
just enjoy it and be peaceful. And uh, I was thinking, oh, yeah, okay, but so, so I can, when you talk, I can see so many parallels with poetry, the idea, mm -hmm. even when you say it's a square within a square, which you could then start to say um, is like a poem in a book, you know, or even just a poem on a page. So mm -hmm. we could say like, this is a poem on a page, you know, the, and the frame is the, the green and then we have the white inside that square. So you've created your own sort of square within a square and, and all the other things about, about the, the line and the similarity that you just described about going over the edges and things like that. So that's like a poet cutting away some of the superfluous lines at the beginning. I don't know if, if any of you write, you'll know that thing of when you love your opening line or you love your closing line and then you suddenly realize they're the ones that are going to have to go. And it's really hard, but you know, they're kind of overdoing it and um, they're saying too much. But how, um, is there a point at which you think about the meaning of your painting as you're working or is it really just totally intuitive? Uh, I think it's I think it's in, in, intuitive and um, and you know and we, we kind of spoke about this before and I love the way you just describe it and I, I, I shouldn't be taking your words because I won't be able to paraphrase them you know but it's kind of like you know you're you're afraid of like taking a side with where ways glance at it like you, you'll be able to phrase it better than me but it's kind of like you know you're working away, but you don't want to really think about that mm. because if you do, you, you're trying to put something into it and, and mm. it's never going to be there, you know? Yeah. Um, I just, I, I don't know, Miss, I just came across this, um, this quote um, yesterday, a, a Rothko quote, and he says, um, and he's talking about artists, and he says, um, you know, we're desperately seeking those pockets of silence where we can root and grow. And it's kind of, I suppose, you know, when you're working, you know, you're hoping that this, some seeds will drop and something kind of, you know, will, will grow. But, you know, you, you, you can't intentionally put it in there in a way yes. or it'll fail almost, yeah. I think, you know, or there's that fear of it. Yeah. And, and a lot of things are happening mm. as well. Mm. You know, it's a, like I find that that I'm not necessarily starting with one idea and then think I'm going to write a poem about that. Or even if I do think that, other stuff's going on in your head and uh, for me especially like I'll be reading a lot uh, 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 at the same time so I might pick up ideas and tones and a line that I overhear in a mm. shop or something and I'll think oh yeah that could go in and then things take these sort of strange directions mm. and so as you're working you you're, you're trying to build up a, a voice and for me certainly when I'm writing there has to be a voice there there has to be a, a, a mouth like speaking this stuff or else it goes a bit dead and this is why actually um, for a while, I, I didn't have any voice saying anything. So everything I wrote did just, it just lay on the page. It was, like, it was an idea, but it wasn't, it wasn't coming to life. And for it to come to life, a person it has to appear in my head like a character. So I suppose, you know, you call that persona, but, but, but that idea, and then it, it takes off. And that's when I would become afraid to start going, oh, what does this mean? I wouldn't want to be doing that because I, I, I need it then to start doing its own thing. And, and maybe later I'll understand what it means, which which seems funny, doesn't it? If you're if you're the one making it, that you might mm. not know. Um, like uh, for example, I'll read this one because it has the name. The, the, my first book was called This Is Yarrow, and so yarrow is a wildflower. And um, this 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 is kind of about we we're talking about this about naming. You know, I'm so attracted to the names of your paintings as well. Maybe we can talk about that about choosing names. But this one. Um, like it has a ridiculous beginning actually totally unrelated to the poem itself and at the time i was studying russian poetry and one of the poets that i was studying her she sent a letter to another poet that just said do you still love me and that's all that it was like a postcard and she had never met this poet right she was like really intense and over the top and i thought that's hilarious like you know, like, <laughs> you know um because he hadn't replied to her last letter and it was it was just so Oh, um, yeah, over the top. And, I, and this, so this phrase was rattling around in my head. And then it appears in this poem, not by her or she doesn't say it or anything, but it was, it was, it was there and I stole it basically for this. But the poem means something completely different, you know, or does it? <laughs> so I'll read it anyway. And, uh, and, and it's just about how it's changed its meaning as well over the years. And it, maybe I'll say at the beginning as well that I wrote it not long after I'd moved from Ireland to England. And so I grew up in Dublin and sort of moved from Dublin, capital city. I'd moved to the north of England, um, to the Yorkshire Dales. Uh, so very different setup altogether. This is Yarrow. 
In this country house, I had a dream of the city, as if the thick yarrow heads had told me, as if the chokered dove had told me, or the yellow elder seeds had made me ask. And in the dream, I went up to the dirty bus station, and I saw the black side of the power station. And as if the brown moths tapping at the window made me say it, I said, do you still love me? And when I woke and went to the window, your tender voice told me, this is Yarrow, this is Elder, this is the collared dove. So that's like a really simple poem, like nothing much happens. And the words are sort of repeated more or less. But what, what happens is the words just get a little bit more precise. So, you know, the speaker at first calls the dove a chokered dove and at the end calls it a collared dove, so has learned the actual correct name. And, and, and the same with being told, you know, you, you call this Yarrow. So th these are the names. And I, and I think without realizing it, what I was doing was struggling with that idea of learning, actually, of knowing, of knowing the names of things. And I think as a poet, um, I started off thinking poetry was pure inspiration. You know, it should come from inside. If it's not coming from inside, it's not the real thing. And, and, and again, I don't know if any of you have had this, this realization that it's okay to learn, it's okay to actually go out and find out more stuff and, and educate yourself and educate your poems. Um, and, and, and again, this, was, this seemed like the wrong way to approach creative work. And as I grew up and, and got older, I realized, no, you can, and in fact, it makes the work better. And a bit like in life, walking through a, 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 a field you notice things more when you've learned what they're called. It doesn't mean that they're ruined or they've become scientific or that, you know, the magic has been taken away. Actually, you notice them more when you learn about them. And, and, and I think this is about like, same with language as well. But, in, you know, it took me years to know what that poem was, was about, really, years. And I was saying that it was somebody, um, I had to do a reading in Germany and they wanted the poems um, projected in German while I was reading in English. I mean, it wasn't just me, it was, like, <laughs> it was lots of people. But they got a translator to translate everyone's poems and the translator asked me loads of questions about this poem. And it was really only in answering their questions that I started to learn a little bit more about, what, about that idea of naming and what was happening, the progression and, and, and that. But um, names, how do you like, your names are so beautiful and, and the paintings are very, very simple. The names are, are quite evocative and poetic, I would say. So um, do they come naturally or do you spend ages thinking about them? Um, no, I wouldn't say they come naturally, I suppose. Mm -hmm. um, uh, let me see. I suppose, I think the, the orchard, let me see. I think the orchard possibly, um, you know, what because the orchard, which took place in the old bottle gallery in 2013, and um, my husband Rob had just moved to Ireland, um, just you know, a year or two before that, and we had um, we decided we'd take on this task of kind of clearing this kind of orchard, or yeah. you know, bringing it back to to some kind of um, uh, not not it, it it had gotten very overgrown with ivy, and you you could couldn't find your way in there or out. You know, mm. you get just sort of orientated. So we started clearing back a lot of brambles and. Um, it, uh, so, so I learned all of these these names of plants. You know, I, I do remember, you know, walking home from school, which is one of the best days, you know, uh, the best times of the day, you know, from school in Burn Church, um, where, where I went to school, just mm. literally up the road from where I live now. Um, and uh, but I wouldn't have known the names of the pla the wild plants. So um, so R Rob was able to kind of educate me in that mm. sense, you know, so those kind of bugle, you know, stitch word. Um, yeah. You know all these lovely kind of um, you know words and names, and I think you're right about what you say. You know when you know the the name, you have more value on it. Mm. You know, um, and you know they're all kind of you know weeds as yeah. as people kind of know them. But no, they're native plants yeah. that you know all of this um, these insects live on and they, these birds feed on. You know, so they're just so important in the whole ecology um, of. You know the, of the environment and there's so little regard for it i know it's it's, it's coming back you know a bit yeah, but yeah. for you know 20 30 years 30 40 years you know it was kind of like just get rid of it all you know and isn't that a nice parallel again i'm, I'm just I, I have to draw these parallels because metaphor you know i can't mm. help but see a metaphor and everything but your description of clearing away the brambles mm. and 
you know, revealing these tiny, beautiful um, flowers, which go back, you know, when you start reading about them, have all these medicinal qualities and these histories and it's um, and language as well. And it's just a gorgeous metaphor, isn't it, as well as, as you know, for me anyway, as somebody going into language, you know, and anybody who's ever looked up a word in a diction dictionary will have that experience of like the beauty of a word, the power of a single word and all the things that you can get from one word and the etymology and how it used to be used and how it's changed and all of this. And it's, um, I have a poem actually, you know, I hope you don't mind, like, tell me if you're bored with me punctuating with poems. It's like those programs that you have to fast forward whenever they, they <laughs> sing the song. Oh no, not that bit, fast forward. But anyway, um, at this one, I wanted to read this one because it's really different in my mind. This was also about finding out what something was in the garden too late. And so the character in this, I do like to say these are pers personas, so you know, you can decide if they are or not. But anyway, the person in this poem is a bit hysterical. And um, they've, 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 they've basically been gardening and going a bit wild. And, um, and, and it comes from when I, I did discover the, what feverfew was, right? Does anybody know, have feverfew or come across feverfew? Well, anyway, I was, like, thought it was a weed and very badly took it all out and then to, you read up about it and discovered that it used to be used for women who were who were hysterical <laughs> and, and who'd get fevers and thought and I mm. so I imagined that there was this, this person who had done that and then was struck with this terrible fever as a kind of punishment and had no cure then for themselves so so this is me having really good fun with inventing a character who is a sort of heightened version maybe um, of me or whatever but really just going for it and trying to get that kind of voice and it's called fever few in the evening, when the TV's off, I don't do needlework and I don't do tapestries or write checks to the horticultural society. I am lacking a sorority, sir. My curriculum vitae is very poor in places. But really, it's no good being vague now. Here, you must press on my wrist. You must press on my side. Is it fast, general practitioner? Is it high? You mustn't send me away for tests, doctor. We must talk. We must talk about it. You see, there were five, ten, maybe twenty of them in a group and hanging around, waiting around like daisies, only not as good, not as true. And what did I do, sir? I bullied the circle unkindly. Up with the traitor, I cried in error, down with the star, and I tore up their union. I made them fight and become weak, uprooting them until I smelt their undersmell of death and was too late, too late, horrified. My continental sister, gasping on the ground, had hardly cried at all. And then, all that day, doctor, and then all that night, such heat, and now still I feel it radiate. What do you say about it? What can I take? Oh, I know I should find out more before I pull things out, but I don't. <laughs> so, the regret poem, you know. And I've learned, I, oh, by, by the name, I've learned not to pull them out oh, until yeah. I know what they are. But I, I was that good. person. I, 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 when, I thought, when I saw your regret. paintings, I thought, she's really not that person. You're the opposite. So I was kind of reading that. It's the opposite of you. So I'm quite relieved that you have, you have made that mistake. I learned. It's such a hard <laughs> feeling. Yeah. And you do, and you mm. learn to. And it's the delicacy. That's the thing, isn't it? It's the del delicacy of it. And the. Oh, and, but it's, yeah. it's, the, it's the control as well. You can, you think it's only yeah. what you put in, you know. Yeah. That's what that's what you want to grow. But really, yes. there's all of these things that are growing, you know. Yeah. That you know, so you have to leave, you know. And uh, um, yeah, so they're, they're they're there anyway, and they're going to come up. But it's it's mm. it's kind of that selective, just not destroying what's there, you know. Just yeah. not imposing your will on it, I suppose, as well. But that's that is really your style of painting. I mean, that is what I think really characterizes your work is this total lack of ego. It is really <laughs> you. I just think it's, that's what really is remarkable about it. You, you, there's no sense that you're going to interfere with this. You're going to listen and look and let the thing appear. And again, in terms of metaphor, that description of like um, what's growing underneath. It's not what you put in. Mm. It's, it's what comes out. And I learned so much. I went to um, your studio yesterday and learned so much about the process of, of this very thing. And I noticed you have Raymond Carver there and you tell me this story. Will you, will you tell us the story about how, which I think is the same thing of like mm. finding out mm. that something's there that you didn't know was there. Well, I'll read the poem. Yeah, read I? the poem. Um, 
This is, um, I think this, this is probably my introduction really to poetry. Thank you, Peter. I think I saw you coming in uh, for uh, my 40th birthday, it was a gift. And, um, uh, and I was, uh, there was a, an exhibition that I had to, that I, well, I, I made an open submission to this um, uh, the uh, gallery in, in Sligo that they wanted to you to make a painting ba on a particular theme and this year it was a, um, a poem which I didn't really like as I thought well that's you know a bit too kind of um, forced so um, but I came across this poem and I thought oh yeah I could do that so it's the poem is called what you need for painting from a le uh, what you need for painting from a letter by Renoir the palette flake white rose madder Chrome yellow, cobalt blue. Naples yellow, ultramarine blue. Yellow ochre, emerald green. Raw umber, ivory black. Venetian red, raw sienna. French vermilion, viridian green. Madder lake, white lead. Don't forget, palette knife, scraping knife, essence of turpentine. Brushes, pointed Martin hair brushes, flat hog hair brushes. Indifference to everything except your canvas, the ability to work like a locomotive, an iron will. So I, um, because I'm a very practical person, I set myself the task of um, layering all of these colors of, of paint one on top of one another. I thought, yeah, I can do that. You know, it's very, so I took this very practical approach and um, I, I put all uh, 16 colors on top of one another. And uh, I ended up with this kind of grey white painting that I was quite happy with. You know, it's, um, you saw a similar version mm. to it kind of yesterday. And I thought, um, you know, maybe it's not a, I don't know, interpretation or whatever by the poem, but it's what I did in response to the poem. So, um, so as I was um, getting it ready, I had it on another background and I had to get it ready to send off in the post on this board. And um, so it was on canvas. and. Uh, I, I took it off the um, uh, initial surface and um, as I, I had just done that then and I turned it around and I realized that all of these things was happening underneath that I hadn't expected. Um, so it, what it looked like was um, because I had primed it, you know, with, with white, there was a little bit of kind of, you know, the, the, it wasn't just like a, a raw canvas because it was kind of slightly mottled with kind of white but all around the edge, it had these bleeds of all of these 16 little colors. Yeah. And uh, so, so as there was a little minor controversy, some people didn't like it and were describing it as a blank canvas, what's it doing there? And so it had, it had that quality of, um, of a blank canvas, but with all of this detail on the edge. So I just felt, God, you know, it, it, this, this is much more what the poem is about, yeah. you know, and potential and, um, you know, and there's still that repetitive kind of thing in it, you know, and um, so that's what I did. So I flipped the painting and, you know, sent that off to the exhibition instead. I do think um, that's, I think that's so interesting and kind of funny mm. because it's that, it's that process thing that you mm. don't know what's happening until the end, you mm. know, mm. and, but you have to go through it. Mm. And again, like as a poet or as anyone who works in, in doing anything creative, you know that that's the thing. You have to go through this thing and it can take a while. It doesn't happen quickly necessarily. Like sometimes it, I suppose it does, but quite often there's that long stage of thinking, I'm doing this now. I don't know what it is. I don't know whether it's any good even. I'm just doing it. I'm going to keep going until eventually maybe something will happen. And like, um, but I, I think it's very funny, the controversy, you know, it's just a blank canvas. And that was something I was going to talk about, maybe about that idea that, you know, there is a, um, there is an expectation sometimes, not so much now, maybe, but there has been an expectation that, you know, paintings are going to have things going on in them. They're going to have, you know, as I said before, a narrative or, or or people and um, certainly just just that that it just your process reminded me as well of my most recent book which um, things you know the, if, if you thought that Emily Dickinson poem was short with the eight lines there's um, you know th this has even shorter poems in it so mostly white pages with um, a, f a, f a few lines six lines four lines two lines one line sometimes four words so this is me really 
maybe going a bit too far in one extreme <laughs> of really abstraction. Not, yeah, really abstraction and just and, it, they, and many of them started out quite long and me just saying, no, I can't have it, I can't have it, I can't have it until finally I just thought, OK, yeah, that's that's, I think, what I meant and realizing it was it was very short and not knowing what what the hell was going on. <laughs> but um, but trying to get the essence. So coming back to that word, the glimpse or the essence and sometimes like laughing at them, thinking, yeah, I think that's I think that's done it. Like, who needs a poem? You know, if I can say it in just a few words and just mm. having a bit of fun as well with that. It's kind of a crisis, total crisis point, total disaster on the one hand. On the other hand, kind of trying to laugh at myself having this crisis. And so, like, for example, I often think like I almost didn't need to publish the whole book. I think this one very short, for the very first poem in the book, which is three lines long, kind of captures the crisis period um, and also the humor I was trying to see in it, which I'll just read it out to you. It's very short. Tell me, he said, when our paths crossed on the green, do they call you a poetess? Oh, I said, they don't use that word anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Try to get the kind of double meanings. And, um, but, you know, they're not all long. And, and the other thing I just wanted to say, you know, I just thought I could read this I sort of as talking about, about think about you sort of flipping things around, trying stuff out, flipping them around, ending up with what looks like this, this bare canvas, but you realize there are these colors all around the edge. And when you, when you hear about the story, it's just fascinating that you got there, that this is Renoir's palette, but just in tiny, tiny bleed, as you call it so evocatively, around the edge of the canvas. And um, what, I'll read out this, this poem. I went through a phase, um, because I, as I say, there was this weird three years, maybe longer, where I, I didn't have this, this sort of poetry voice in my head at all. But I was still wanting to write, and I was still kind of reading and interested in different ways of writing. And, um, but I got into this real flat writing. I just wanted to write everything really flat and, and, and have like no lyricism to it. And I was interested, what happens when you do that? And I had been watching these contemporary dances. Pina Bausch, uh, a contemporary dance choreographer, very experimental. And I kind of got into these and I thought, what would happen if I described what was going on in the dance as I see it? Like, it's almost as if I was just transcribing it, very, very dull. And what happened was, it, I just was experimenting and I found that I, by the, by the last line, to me anyway, it was like, on the one hand, very flat, and then suddenly by the last line, something else happens and like a whole life suddenly appears. And when I see your little black mark, I think maybe that's what I was trying for. It's like, it looks kind of blank, but there's maybe something black or dark just suddenly appears at the end. You think, hmm, maybe it's not what I thought. So I'll, I'll read it out and see, see what you think. This is the last, there are four dance, they're called four dances. And this is the last one, it's called the inspection dance. I was wearing my long pink satin dress and high heel shoes and I was standing in the middle of a room. All the men had to fight their way through to stroke my hair touch my face, prod my stomach, and pluck the skin around my collarbone. They lifted me up and shook me to see if anything would fall out. When they slapped me, it was like you might slap the rump of an animal. At some point, I'm not sure exactly when, all the men went away. It's hard to remember. So very flat, not really like a poem at all, but it, it was that last line, it's hard to remember, that I sort of thought has sort of a two meanings and then allowed me to kind of look back into the description again. So a bit like this little black mark mm -hmm. emerging and this black painting that's underneath the white painting. It's kind of fascinating, isn't it? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. All this kind of, you know, you know, labor that there's some evidence of it there evidence. in some way. Yeah, you know. that's a nice word. Um, but what about expectations? I think this is the one thing. I know we're coming to the end now, actually. So maybe if I could, well, we end on that topic of expectations about mm. kind of... I hope you're going to read um, the... the um, what did you want me to read? <laughs> the, the, the one, uh, the Agnes Martin. The, oh, yeah, yeah OK. I think well, we could end with that then, and then... Um, and Easterly. Um. You're going to see my, <laughs> my best friend. Watch it. Everyone's like, no, no, we're fine. Um, no, we got time. OK. Mm. Well, the thing about the mm. expectations mm. one was just that, that, that idea. You know, and certainly with, with, with my book, Savage Tales, I've found... Um, I found it really hard to know how I was going to read from it. It was that my, my second book I wrote for reading aloud 
and really enjoyed that. I wrote for the for the voice, and then when it so when it came to performing it, it I had great fun, you know, because mm. it was already there, ready to be read. Whereas this one, I didn't think about performing it at all. It was very much more sort of like internal, the the the, the anguish, the cry, or whatever, mm. the the kind of the non voice really, just the struggle to speak. So when it, I kind of published it to my horror, it was published, and um, I thought, oh, I just couldn't work out how I was going to read from it, and. I, to launch it, because the publisher likes to launch, uh, um, it was on Zoom uh, with, with this, you know, this horrible Zoom experience. And I thought, oh, that's going to be terrible. But it turned out it was very useful, actually, because I did the shared screen thing and I just showed the words. So I, it went away from me into much more like I reproduced the page and I kind of could just show the words as I read. So that was interesting. So at the moment, I'm trying to work out how I can bring Zoom to the live to the live stage, but that's a different story. But um, so in terms of expectations, sometimes I have to, I, I feel like I should explain. Sometimes these don't sound like poems. I don't know if they are poems, you know, and it's that kind of thing of, I don't know, I don't know what's going on, <laughs> but something happened anyway. Um, but oh yeah, we were going to talk about influence, because you were talking about being influenced by a poem. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I've been influenced by paintings quite a lot. Um, and. I set myself an ekphrastic challenge. This is our word. We were talking about this word, ekphrasis, you know, or ekphrasis. This whole process of that a, a writer looks at a work of art and writes about it, I, like responds to it. It used to be that they write, it, they describe it, but now it's much more like we respond to it. So in a way, those dances are like ekphrasis, aren't they? That I was responding to a work of art. But Agnes Martin, who you know does these huge square paintings, often white with maybe a very faint pencil drawn grid. That's it. And I thought, OK, let's write about that. Let's see what happens. But it, it really corresponded with my own idea of, of wordlessness. And, and, and I thought, uh, so I thought, I'll limit. Everything has to be very limited. Again, the limited vocabulary and repetition. It was all repetition, all these lines repeated with dots. She sometimes drew just repetition. And um, so I read that. But the poem is on the front cover of the book because again I was kind of into like making stuff not just typing it up in a computer so I, I typed it with a, my grandmother's old typewriter on an old piece of paper and my husband was just messing around drawing this image and so it's reproduced there on the cover but it's not inside the book so that poem is only this kind of object but it's not a poem inside the book so you can hear if I read it out how I was trying to get a kind of kind of repetition and, and the poem could go in a loop. You could keep reading it again and again. It just keeps going around. And it uses um, Agnes Martin's title. She, like you, she has beautiful titles. So, I painted a painting called This Rain. All night, the black ran down. In the morning, the studio floor was a flooded plain. Then I painted a painting called Milk River. I painted a painting called Milk River. All night, the white ran down. In the morning, the studio floor was a flooded plain. Then I painted a painting called This Rain. I think just keep going red. I think it's, <laughs> I think it's wonderful. Um, and I, I, I love actually, um, I mean, I love the, 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 um, the, the light and dark in it, yeah. kind of the, you know, the inside outside, you know, the plain, the, the, very much the studio, and then you're, you're kind of a flooded plain. Mm. And it's just, I think it's just, you know, just so, painterly. I'm really to, glad you think that. It's funny, way. isn't yeah, it? And obviously yeah. I was trying to get into that. I think yeah. that type, it sounds ridiculous actually mm. over the top, but the idea of typing mm. it onto an old scrap of paper, mm. it was all so kind of, it, obviously I was craving some, mm. some made thing mm. that wasn't clean and perfect and perfectly reproduced. And I really got into that idea that it only existed as this sort of document. And if it got lost or torn or something, that was it, it was gone. <laughs> and it's, it's kind of like the, the poem as an object. Definitely, you know, which absolutely. I, you know, which I yes. kind of wondered about in, in the, the process of, of kind of, you know, writing a, a poem. You know, what happens all the other, um, you know, versions or, you know, bits. So, so this is actually a physical object of a poem as well. Yeah, and you know, we were mm. talking about an anonymity, and I think I was mm. kind of into that idea that, like, on the one hand, it's totally unique. There's nothing else. You know, this is this one object. But on the other hand, it's, it was totally throwaway as well. It was just mm. kind of nothing. Mm. And I really enjoyed that idea. I think that kind of, it's not that serious. Um, 
it's it's a thing and and if it goes you can make another one <laughs> and but you know and, and maybe that was the patron mm, painterly mm, thing as well that idea mm. of like you can paint over something and it's gone mm, it's mm. not you're not clinging on to everything mm. all the time you know and Agnes Martin said that she wanted people to approach her paintings like like there's somebody walking into the water no interruption you know and, I, and obviously I was kind of attracted to that as well and it's no surprise that I'm so attracted to yours as well then it, it is that sort of it's 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 funny to say it, isn't it? It's like beauty and and purity of of experience. I think that's it. It's it's the purity of of the experience of something without your interference on it. You know. And so I was, I'll I'll end with this very short. I mean, I'll end with my readings with this very short poem, which I was thinking, to me is is like me struggling to do what you do, right? <laughs> so this is this is called Easterly. Again, very short. A warm late summer breeze in the last days of August blows the hawthorn's thick leaves away from its face. Too many adjectives, but how to let go? A breeze in August parts my mother's hair. It's um, just, you know, how, how, you know, you can be just so brief and say so much, yeah. you know, and, uh, you know, um, I suppose you, you're almost talking about kind of grammar and then you talk yeah. about parting and loss and, you know, um, I suppose it, 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 it made me think about my, my mm. mother and my mother when she was dying and, yeah. you know, parting, all of that kind of stuff. So it's such a short thing and it's just so dense, you know. I mean, that not, may not be, you know, what, that, but that's what I take that's from perfect. it as well. Yeah. Do you know, it's Absolutely. just uh, really beautiful. But doesn't that just correspond to the kind of, we can come right around to the beginning and say, and that's what I felt when mm. I walked in the room and mm. see your picture, mm. it's, it's small. You know, it's only the measure of our forearm. <laughs> there it is. It kind of says it all. Mm. You know, so perfect conclusion. <laughs> I think we've we've reached. Um, it's been great. It's just been wonderful. I could talk to you like I could, I could sit here and chat all day. But I suppose we should let somebody else have a mm. word in edgeways. Mm -hmm. If if does anybody have any questions? I do have a question, but I just want to thank you both for talking about made into the work and making your work and all the things that go in to the making and yeah. the bits that are underneath. Wonderful. Oh, thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. I'm glad. Yeah. Uh, yeah. As the person who's not terribly creative, but would love to be, how do you know when something's finished? How ah. do you put a, a full stop? How does that happen? Or is it different for every? Pull car work of art. You know what I mean? Like, how do you know? Uh, well, I, I'll just say it for, for me. I suppose it's kind of, and we were talking about, you know, in terms of, you know, kind of meaning almost as well, but you kind of, but there's something you can smell it almost. It's kind of like a sense kind of thing, you know, um, that, yeah, I've, I've pushed it as far as it can go. And so whether that's the result is, is good or bad almost, but you, you know that it's not going to go any further, you know, and that, and that in some sense that it may have a life then on its own without you, you know, that yeah, you kind of... get out into the world, you're ready to kind of... Yeah, and, it, and, and it's, it's ready to survive on its own in some way as well. Yeah. Do you know, it's, um, yeah, it's, that's, that, it's done. Off you go. Um. <laughs> Is that hard though? It must be hard to kind of, especially with your paintings. I mean, like, they're so hmm. refined and quiet and still. And I see that, I, hmm. you know, I know this, it's different for everybody. But to go, Mm, it just, mm, mm. I would imagine that's really hard, that tinkering element that we all can have. To be like, oh, well, if I just store. Well, you can see. Your... Well, no, I think it's, it's just because there's a lot of that tinkering prior, prior to that to point, you know. So when you yeah. get to that point, then it's, thank God that's done with, <laughs> you know. It's almost, it's kind of, I've been trying and trying and trying and, you know, um, you know, I, I showed Tara some kind of work yesterday when you can push it so far and so far. It's a bit like the, the what you need for painting one that it's not working and it's never going to work, you know, and you strip it all back. And then you, you kind of discover that there was something there all along that you almost, you know, weren't in control of. Well, you weren't in control of, but it's, it's there. There's some kind of evidence of, of that labor or something that you, you kind of put into it. And it happened without your being part of it almost. 
So it's um, yeah, because that painting, the paint, the finished painting is the stripped back yeah. canvas. Yeah. You know, everything's yeah. been taken away, but it's left a mark, and it was that mark that you thought. Yeah, that's yeah. that's it. Yeah. yeah. So it's kind of again, it's not like it's not it's not you know with your hand. It almost happened without you in some ways, even though you've been working on it for forever. Is there you know? an of nearly a surprise going? Oh, there it is. Oh, and that's what's yes. Oh my God, look. Look what's happened there. Who did that? You know, <laughs> or how did that happen? Do you know? So that's kind yeah. of exciting. That's as a good well, word, actually. Surprise, I think. Yeah. And I think that's what you know, um, hmm. like you aim for. I don't think you always get it, hmm. but that feeling that if you leave it aside for a little while and you read it back and you're a bit surprised by it, hmm. that's really great because hmm. it means there's something else there that's not too um, expected. You know, because that's the thing. You know, I think that you. That's why it's really hard. To, you have to tell yourself you write it quite badly, for me anyway. I might um, write something down and the temptation to think, oh, this is so awful, I can't bear to write it down. And you have to kind of tell yourself, you, I mean, you speak to yourself and say, you know you have to write it down really badly first, like it has to be bad first. And then you'll, you'll work on it and, and try and find what it is in there that, you, that there's something there. Sometimes it might just be one line, but it, that's the time issue, I think, that's where you know, and again, I was quite old before I realized that you did need to spend time. I thought it was like, oh, I'll write and then it's done and I mustn't touch it because it came pure and natural and that must be the real thing. Don't touch it. And it was many, many I mean, years and years for me to kind of cop on that things changed from that initial moment of inspiration, changed quite a lot. But I think, yeah, it's that thing of, you do get into a bit of a funny trance, I think, even though it sounds I don't know, it sounds ridiculous, but I think that's where the time, we were talking about this time in the studios, time in the room, wherever it is you do your work, there's a kind of time where you, you're you just there, you know, and you're just trying to work on something and, and, and you kind of enter into it and then at some point you think, I think it's finished, you know, and then you leave it for a while and, <laughs> and it might be or it might not be. Yeah. Yeah, I, I'm a, I enjoyed your talk enormously, particularly the way you interacted with one another. And I, I've seen Chickweed now three different <laughs> <laughs> And then last week, uh, James Hart referenced it. And yeah. today, I almost feel there should be a basin underneath to catch the flight, is it? I know. <laughs> well, my main question is to you as a poet. When you saw the German translation of your poet, oh, yeah. of, your, of your poem on screen, did those who saw the words hear the meaning that you meant to convey. And did you understand the translation? No, like I don't speak German. Obviously I could, I could see what the, what the translator had done. And um, it was a very interesting experience for me because I've studied translation as a, as a mode. Not, I don't speak other languages, but I, I did my PhD in why people translate and what it's all about. And so I was very intellectually um, went for the kind of the pure translation, the translation is exactly the same as the original. And, and this translator didn't do that. They, she kind of slightly tweaked some of my words so that in German it got a, a similar experience, like the reader would get a similar experience, but she changed some of the words. And um, I was absolutely, I had no problem with that at all. I was really surprised. I thought I would be far more um, touchy about it. <laughs> and, um, and, and I didn't mind at all. In fact, I thought it was fascinating. I mean, it's very nice to be translated, but did they... Was it enhanced or diminished or just change? I suppose I, I kind of, I felt it was much more intelligent in German. Because, <laughs> <laughs> well, I felt so like, yes, me, the dual linguist, you know. So there was, it felt like elevated. But I think that's just because I didn't understand it. But yeah, it was a very, it was a very nice experience, actually. To, and, and perhaps that's the other thing about not, not fully understanding maybe was quite a nice feeling, you know, somebody else had read something more into it. And, and again, um, it's, it's, you know, this is another part of being a poet. If, if people read your poems, which, you know, one never expects them to do. So this is always a bonus that, um, and, and has an idea about what it might mean. Um, again, I always thought a poet would say, no, that's not what it means. Surely they would know, but actually if someone says they've read something into it that you didn't know was there, it changes for you. You don't, you don't think, no, that's not what it was. You just think how wonderful that you've seen that in it. And it, that's so strange. I was really surprised by that as well. It's, it's much, it does become its own thing. I think when, you, when it's out mm -hmm. in the world, mm -hmm. um, it, 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 yeah. 
transfers. Hi, Tom. Um, you mentioned, it was really interesting you mentioned <coughs> using your grandmother's uh, typewriter yeah. on old paper to write poem. And it got me thinking, you know, with Helena as well, as an artist, um, do, do you think using uh, a different medium, like a typewriter, kind of bites back at you almost? It's so mm. physical compared to a, a pen or, or, I guess, water paints versus drawing with charcoal. Uh, how does do you think the medium you use affects the uh, uh, where do you bring the, the finished poem or painting to, um, in a, in a, or is it something you in in terms of artist is it something you intend you know I'm going to use charcoal because mm. hex and I'm going to use oil paint because I feel why. I mean it's a brilliant question. Mm -hmm. So and and in fact. It makes me realise how much I've learned from talking to you about about your drawing, and and we were talking about how these paintings they can't have a signature on them really because the the whole painting is the painting. So to put a word on it would would interrupt it too much, uh, which is kind of strange. And and it means then that idea of the ego is is again removed even more. There's no signature on this work, and I think there might be something in that with something like the typewriter that it was it was so it's so practical and clunky. And it's how I first started writing, though. I, 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 had, I got this really beautiful old Underwood from my grandmother. It's like 1930s, and I just loved it. And I used to sit in, in bed sit using that. I, you know, I just loved the, the kind of physicality of it and the clunkiness of it and the little ding that it makes when it comes to the end of the page. So I think it is very, a very practical thing. And it, I think, for me, definitely, it took away the seriousness in a way of it. It was like, on the one hand, it became a physical joyous idea it was like indenting into the page so it was like an ink gets on your fingers when you move the ribbon so it was definitely more like touchable but it wasn't as serious and as i think maybe that's way maybe what i was trying to get away from the kind of once it's on the computer it's like a published thing isn't it and it's all terribly sophisticated and it was like i wasn't i, I didn't want to go there just yet you know it was like let's have this a bit of fun with 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 seeing what words look like on paper. So if you're, do you think I want an effect so I must use charcoal or I want a different effect so I must use oil or is it the other way around? Yeah, I, th I think it's probably the other way around and like, you know, different materials that they, they really are, perform really differently. You know, I've made these um, kind of watercolors like I was, I was explaining yesterday that it's almost I had to measure the amount of uh, a spoon of, of very delicate watercolor, you know, otherwise you'd have time where you'd have all, everything would go wrong. Um, uh, you know, and other, you know, materials I've, I've um, you know, recently started to use kind of um, the paper from potato bags because it, it has a lovely, uh, you know, quality. It just has that texture, which I was trying to do with other paper and I couldn't get it. It was all very sharp. And this has just this lovely kind of undulating kind of uh, quality. So, yeah, some materials and I've, I've, I've often kind of moved then from, you know, I suppose oil paint is what I do kind of use mostly, but I will often switch to another material as well, you know, um, and try to do a bit of drawing in in between maybe, but just to kind of, I suppose, um, get you out of your comfort zone a little bit, you know, and then things invariably happen when, mm. you, when, you're, when you're out of your comfort zone and that kind of leads you in another direction then. But I love the um, idea of you getting your potatoes and, you know, <laughs> yeah. suppose, suppose we get the dinner ready and you're like, yes. oh, wow, yeah, I love these bags and go to drifting away and doing something totally different. It's good. Mm. Very good. Thanks for that question. Does anyone have any other mm. questions? We're all ready for a cup of coffee or something. I think at that note we might yes. end. But how wonderful was that? Yeah. Thank you so much, Tim. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.